Hi class, we are on to section 8.6, uh, parametric equations, graphs, and applications. This is the last section for our textbook. We've covered pretty much every section, I believe, of um, the textbook for this course. Um, this is a very interesting section. This is one that I like a lot. Uh, it's similar to the polar equations where we're, we're not really dealing with the different coordinate system. But we're dealing with a different way of looking at coordinates and graphing things. Okay. So in this section, we're going to look at the basic concepts of parametric equations, how to go between the parametric form of graphs and the, rect or the rectangular equivalents, and looking at the direction of flow. We're going to talk about the cycloid and different applications of parametric equations. Right, so first let's talk about parametric equations of a plane curve. So a plane curve is a set of points, which we call x, y, such that x is given to us by a function and y is given to us by a different function. So every point is given by a pair of functions where the input for that function is t. Okay, so uh, I'm, we may be skipping ahead here a little bit, but generally for a common use of parametric uh, equations would be a particle as it floats through the air. Okay, So over time, it has an x direction movement, and over time, it has a y direction movement. Okay, And as we put those together, we can get the floating uh, kind of curve that a particle could trace through the air. Right. So what we're basically looking at is how x and y change over time and both of those changes are given by a function right here x is given by f of t and y is given by g of t okay. so f and g are both defined over the same interval okay that interval is called i it exists from a to b i guess you would say right so the equations f of t and g of t are called r parametric equations okay the parameter the thing that changes is t right that's the input for these functions generally t stands for time in this case right so here's an example okay we're going to graph a plane curve that's defined parametrically here x is given by the function t squared and y is given by the function 2t plus 3 so what we do is we basically set up a table of values okay we start with our input value t. We generally start from zero, right? Because we don't really talk about what happens before we start a timer, right? So we talk about time zero and forward, right? So we will start with t equals zero, then go t equals one, t equals two, t equals three, etc., etc., or whatever seems the most appropriate for our spacing of t. And then as we go through the different values of t, we look at the different values of x. Well, if t of zero, if t is 0, what is x? We do the same thing for y. Well, if t is 0, then what is y going to be? If t is 1, what is x? If t is 1, what is y? And we get our x, y pairs by looking at different values of t. Okay. So here we're going to start from negative 3 to 3. So here it's nice that they're giving us an interval. But generally, we start from 0 to some defined endpoint in time because using negative values doesn't really make sense if you're keeping track of time but we're not really keeping track of time here because there's no context it's just saying hey plug in these values for t for these equations right so we're going to graph the set of ordered pairs that we get from plugging in the different spacings of the value t over these two periods of time right so again make a table of values t x and y over the domain which is from negative 3 to 3 so I'll go negative 3 negative 2 1 negative 2 negative 1 0 1 2 3 I'll just plug in my values here um, at a spacing of 1 because that's the easiest thing to do uh, well x is just the squared value of t so I should get 9 4 1 0 1 4 9 right I'm just squaring my input values to get my value of x okay and for y I'm taking these values of t I'm doubling them and adding 3, right? So at 0, I should have 3, and then I'm really just counting by 2s, right? So this should be 3, 5, 7, 
9, and then going back down by 2s because it's a linear equation, right? So here you go. You see the difference between all the values are 2, and the y-intercept is 3 because we know how to graph lines well, right? So now my coordinate pairs is plug in 9, get out negative 3, right? Plug in 4, get out negative 1. These are my pair of coordinates that I'm going to graph on the regular rectangular coordinate system, right? The regular Cartesian plane. Okay, so let's go back here. 9, negative 3, for instance. So I go to 9 and I have negative 3. That's my first point. Okay, my second point is 4, negative 1. So I start here and then my next one is at 4. And then, you know, the scale here is terrible. So 4, that would be negative 1, right? So I start here and then as I graph, I'll end here. So my movement, if I was tracing a particle as it you know, uh, move through space, this is where it would go. It would start here and it would flow this way, right? So obviously this is um, sort of a rotated parabola. If we looked at this as just the function, we would just have a rotated parabola, but we would not have the direction. Having a parametric set of equations lets us know the direction of flow for this rectangular equation that I have. So again, the arrowheads indicate the direction the curve traces as t increases, right? So if you try to do this, you'd have to change in your calculator the type of graph. So your graph does polar coordinates. It does um, Cartesian rectangular coordinate system. It'll graph uh, imaginary uh, systems, and it'll graph parametric equations, right? So you just you got to go through the mode and the options to kind of change how it is that you're looking at your graphs if you want to use your calculator for this. Desmos actually does not do this, so I can't pull up some animations for you guys. Um, I'm sure if I looked around on the internet, I could find some, but it's okay, right? Um, I'll leave that for you guys to do. So example two, find an equivalent rectangular equation, right? So for this last example, we have a sideways parabola. So what we're going to do now, and what we would be interested in is what would be an equation, a standard x and y type of equation, that would model the same behavior? But of course, without the directional arrows, right? That would be of interest to me, okay? So here we're gonna do the same thing. We have the same equation, right? So what we do, when we do this, is we basically look at this as a system of equations. That's the easiest way to do this, okay? Um, I look at a system of equations where I am trying to eliminate t, okay? So for this example, I would take this equation here, me personally, um, I haven't previewed this uh, thing in a while since I made it, but what I would do is I would solve for t here, okay? I would get t on one side, everything on the other side, so this would be 1 half times y minus 3 equals t. I would take that and plug it in to the t here, and then you'll get out your equation, right? So you basically take whatever one is easiest to solve the t for, and you plug it into the other equation. That gets rid of all of your t's, and you're left with uh, some equation and only x and y, and then you can graph it, okay? Um, just as, you know, just from knowing what these kind of equations are, usually for a regular parabola, it's y equals x squared, maybe plus 3 or something, right? If, depending on how we shift the parabola. Since this one is rotated, translated, shifted across the x-y line, uh, this should look something like uh, x equals y squared plus 3, right? Because we're shifted. Our, uh, this is just my guess, right? So if I said plus 3, I think we would move this way. Um, no, we're shifted up. That's fine. So it should be uh, x equals y squared plus 3 because we're still shifting up. It should actually be uh, x squared, x equals y minus 3 and that whole thing squared because we're shifted along the y axis. So we got to shift it in the uh, in the y direction. Okay, so that's my call. Just from knowing how functions work, I can kind of look at it and be like, oh, this is the equation by looking at the trans transformations, right? The translations in the uh, up and down and left and right movements. So <clears throat> Long story short, let's get to the work, right? So let's eliminate this parameter t by solving one of these equations for t. The easiest one would be this second one here, okay? So 
if I were to solve the squared, I would get basically t equals square root x and t equals negative square root x, square root x. I would get two answers. I don't want that. I want the one that has the unique solution, only one solution, which would be this one, right? So I'll solve for t. Okay, so again, solving for the t, I subtract 3 on both sides and divide the whole thing by 2. Okay, so I plug this then into x equals t squared. So basically, I get x equals this thing squared, right? And then I have to expand this, so I'll get a 1 fourth, which I can move to the other side and have 4x. And then I can expand y minus 3 squared, so that'll give me y squared. Uh, minus 6y plus 9 equals 4x, okay? Or you can leave it like this, as I said before, because now I basically have uh, x equals y minus 3 squared, but then of course I had some term that I couldn't find just by looking at the graph, but I did say there would be a translation in the y direction by positive 3, so I thought it was x equals y minus 3 squared, but I'm very, very close, right? There is an extra 4 here, so which makes it a little bit wider than a normal parabola, which is fine. Um, so now we have these values, right? So since t has this domain, x has this domain, and y has this domain, or I guess you could say this range in this domain, since we're swapping the input and output values, here a little bit. Um, let's go here, right? So x, smallest value is 0, largest value is 9, right? For y, smallest value is negative 3, largest value is 9. Here for t, smallest was negative 3, largest was 3, right? So if we go back here to um, these intervals of existence, right? We need these to share the same intervals of existence, right? So we're really going to be looking. Um, at this rectangular equation, okay? And that exists for this input value from zero to nine, okay? So example three, we wanna graph a plane curve defined parametrically, again, right? So we're gonna graph the plane curve defined by x equals two sine t and y equals three cosine t for t being in between the interval zero and two pi, okay? So again, we want to use the fact that sine squared t plus cosine squared t equals 1 because it's going to be very hard to isolate t in either of these equations because then we have to do sine inverse and then plug that sine inverse into cosine. It, it doesn't really help us a lot. Like we had a couple of sections where we had to do that, but it's, it's, it's not very clean, right? So instead, if we try to use this formula, right this identity that we have especially since we have a sine and a cosine present and not a whole lot else we can kind of make our substitutions here right so i would solve this for my cosine i would solve this for my sine square those things and then plug those in here and then we're we no longer have our signs right so here uh x is two sine t so if I square x, I got 4 sine t. Here I got 9 cosine squared t. I will, again, basically solve for cosine squared and sine squared. Okay. And then I can plug those into here. So I'll have x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1, which is the equation of an uh, ellipse. Okay. It's the equation of an ellipse. All right, where you have a minor axis of a length 2 away from the origin and a major axis of a length 3 away from the origin. Okay. All right, a length of 2 away for the minor and a length of 3 away from the major. All right, you might be like, how do you know that, Professor Williams? Well, you're squaring this whole thing. It's really x over 2 squared, y over 3 squared, right? 3 squared is 9, 2 squared is Four, and that's why it's a complete distance of four, right? And a complete distance, sorry, not a complete distance of nine. It's just a square, right? So that's three and it's two. It's the square root of these. Okay. The long one is the major axis. The small one is the minor axis, right? Parametric equations of a curve are not unique. There are infinite many representations 
parametrically for any given curve, all right? So give two parametric equations for the equation of the parabola y equals x minus 2 squared plus 1. Now you can make it difficult, you can make it easy, okay? So we just choose and choose some parameters and we kind of make them fit, okay? So the easiest choice, always, 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 is just say, hey, let x equals t, and then your choice for y just becomes you replacing x with t. Okay, so then this becomes t minus 2 squared plus 1, which is a lot of stuff, but it's easy. Okay, another choice is you can say let x equal t minus 2, and then y would become t squared plus 1, right? That's another easy choice here, right? So you choose one parameter for x, and then you just make the other parameter fit, right? So that the equation is the same, okay? So, right, so again, the other choice is x equals t plus 2, get it to t minus 2, and then you get this as your solution. Okay? So notice, notice that if I say t equals x minus 2, and then I solve that for x, I get t plus 2, right? So if I were to move this over and solve for t, I would get t equals x minus 2, right? t equals this thing. But again, I need it in terms of x and y. I need x equals and y equals. So if I make t equals x minus 2, solve it for x, then it's very easy to see that, okay, I can plug in, since this whole thing is t, I get t squared plus 1, right? But when I rewrite it over here, I need to change it around so it says x equals and y equals, okay? So uh, write substitution. Just make sure that you fix the way that it looks for the parameters, right? So, so some trig functions uh, are desirable sometimes, really depends on the graph that you're using, right? So if you have a bunch of curves, then that would be nice. So for example, here, we could use x is tan t plus two, and then y turns into secant squared plus one, right? Um, because tan t plus two, plugging that in here, that isolates, uh, you basically say tan of t equals x minus 2, right? And so you're saying this is tan, tan of t, and tan t squared plus 1 is secant squared. So you can manipulate these things in several ways. So here they actually gave you three examples, even though they're only asking for two, right? So trying to identify some trig subs instead may take a little bit of work, but just think of the identities that you have. Mostly those Pythagorean identities are going to be the most helpful. Things like the half angle theorem and sum and product formulas, those aren't going to be helpful at all at something like this. Okay. Um, so again, here we'd have to change our domain because now we're talking about tangents and, and secants. So our domain has to be appropriate. It is no longer from negative infinity to infinity because that's not the domain for tangent, right? Um, the cycloid. So the curve traced out by a point at a given distance from the center of a circle as the circle rolls along a straight line is called a cycloid, okay? The cycloid is defined parametrically by x equals a t minus a sine t or a times t minus sine t and a times 1 minus cosine of t, for t being from negative infinity to infinity. So before we get in, I'm going to find an um, animation for you of wh what exactly a cycloid is to make it a little bit easier, right? So abracadabra. Okay, so we're in the world of Desmos. Uh, let's go ahead and look at what a cycloid is, okay? So basically what's going to happen here is we're going to roll this ball in two different directions. And we're going to trace the point that this dot makes as the ball rolls, as it traces through space. Okay. So the curve, the blue line that's made, is what is called a cycloid. So that's a cycloid. Okay. So the equations of cycloids look like this, right? 
Um, so again, we're going to grab the following cycloid. Here we have coefficients of 1, right? So for both of these, a is just 1. This is 1 minus cosine t and t minus sine t, right? So everything is just 1. So there's no uh, multipliers here. And we're going from 0 to 2 pi. So again, by hand, we create a table of values, right? So I have my different values from 0 to pi. I'm kind of just cutting these into fours, right? I kind of skipped a little here, but that's fine. Um, that's what they wanted to do. We got our decimal approximations. We have our x's and our y's, right? So when I plug t into x, this is what I get. When I plug t into y, this is what I get, right? So now I have a bunch of x, y coordinate pairs, and I can graph them to create my cycloid, right? So here I have a... Um, a circle of radius one okay again if I had a different value of a here the a coincides with my radius right so if this was 3 um, t minus 3 sine t is and y equals 3 minus 3 cosine t I'd have a circle of radius 3 and I would basically have the same thing but on a larger scale right um, so we already saw the animation for it. There's no animation here, but that's what the cycloid looks like. And as you go on for different values of uh, 2 pi, right, because that's one full circle, it just repeats again. So if I go for 4 pi, I get two of these arcs. Okay. So <clears throat> if a flexible cord of wire goes through the points P and Q as such, right, so let's say that they're being um, strung up and maybe you have a uh, ball with a hole on it, right? Then a bead is allowed to slide uh, due to gravity without friction. So let's ignore friction for right now, the friction of the string and the bead from P to Q. Then the path that requires the shortest time is going to be a cycloid, an inverted cycloid, because remember a cycloid is this way, so you would basically just take the negative of that, right? Um, so some different applications of a parametric equation. So if a ball is thrown with the velocity of v feet per second at an angle of theta with respect to the horizontal, okay, like so, right? So from here to the direction that you're first throwing it, you have an angle of theta. This uh, line right here represents the force vector, right? You're throwing it and releasing it in this direction with this amount of force. Then the force due to gravity will uh, start to bring it down as it starts to um, go forward and up, right? So its flag can be modeled by parametric equations given by V cosine theta, V again being the velocity, right? Or the length of this force vector from you throwing it. And Y given by uh, V sine theta T which is the upward motion right here. V cosine theta is the forward motion. V sine theta t is the upward motion minus 16t squared. Just so you know, this minus 16 is the uh, force due to gravity uh, coming down, the acceleration due to gravity. And this plus h is the height that the ball was released, right? So this is very, very similar to when you use a standard quadratic to uh, model this, right? So it looks like this, V naught, this is the point. Um, this is your initial velocity vector, right? T here is given in seconds, so now we have a parametric representation, okay? Um, H is the ball's initial height and feet above the ground, as I said before. So for our example, we're going to say three golf balls are hit at the same time into the air at the same velocity, 132 feet per second, okay, or 90 miles an hour. And they're all hit at different angles, one at 30, one at 50, and one at 70 degrees from the flat horizontal plane, the ground, basically, right? So A, assuming that we have a level ground, okay, determine graphically which ball travels the greatest distance, right? We're going to estimate this distance as well. So for these three, we want to find out what the distance is from this initial velocity hit at this angle, okay? The three sets of parametric equations determined by the three golf balls we need to determine, right? And again, that's given to us by these equations. So we know the V and we know the different angles. So we want to 
find our three different sets of parametric equations and then we can figure these out right so three sets of parametric equations um for h equaling zero so because we're hitting a golf ball it's on the ground right the first one coinciding with 30 degrees will give us an x1 as so right so we want to simplify these x2 will look like this okay so we can take 132 times sine of whatever 50 degrees will be and multiply that times t and x3 will be the same thing 132 cosine 70 y2 so 132 sine 70 t minus 16 t okay so these are my three um parametric equations for the three different situations right so we can use the graph calculator which is nice right and so we see that this middle one is the one that goes the furthest right this x2 y2 the 50 degree angle is the better angle however the last one the 70 degree angle is the highest will give us the largest height so if we hit it low we have low and far but not as far as if we kind of hit it in the mid range right so we can use the trace feature to figure out how far exactly it is that we went um, in order to figure this out right so here we get about 540 feet if we use the trace function to go along here and look at the different y values that we have right so which ball reaches the greatest height obviously that's the second one the 70 degree measure right and we want to estimate its height so we'll use the trace again to trace out the height right so we go until we hit kind of the highest point possible um, and that should be about 240 feet okay so here is the next example okay uh, last example I believe or the last section of our textbook so good job class um, we want to examine parametric equations of flight Jack launches a small rocket from a table that is 3.36 feet above the ground so real quick let's just backtrack a little bit um, you may be asking yourself how do I find these values without using a calculator right and so if you notice they're all quadratic in nature so you can use things that we know about quadratics right um, first of all you'd have to get a single quadratic formula for these right some sort of parabola before you can start to maximize or minimize these and that would create a lot of work basically right once you get to calculus 3 calculus 3 we talk about parametric equations a lot and then you can start talking about how to optimize these things in their parametric forms right so let's go ahead and come back to the example that we were about to start here all right so again uh, Jack launches a small rocket from a table that is 3.36 feet above the ground. Its initial velocity is 64 feet per second, and it is launched at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to the ground, right, from the horizontal. So we want to find the rectangular equation that models its path, right? So what type of path does the rocket follow? So uh, we know it's going to be quadratic, because I've said that a million times, right? Um, it's a parabola, right? So 64 cosine 30 for x, 64 sine 30, t minus 16 uh, t squared plus the height of the table. So they don't go through all the math, but again here you want to find cosine of 30, multiply that by 64, right? So this will have a divisor of 2, so this should be 32 root 3, right? Same thing here, this is half of 64, so you have 32 t you'll have your 16 t then this is your 3.36 right so you have a quadratic on one a radical on the other and then you want to eliminate the parameter right so the easiest one will be this one solve for t take that t and plug it into here right okay so now t is x over 32 root 3 we're going to substitute that into y we're going to get the following so this gives me um well, we have to square it first before we can cancel so don't do this out of order right uh, but things will cancel here so for instance this turns into x over root 3 um, this will turn into something still not very nice right but we'll have something that's a quadratic and then from here if you want to you can find the max and the min using um, 
right? The max height happens at negative b over 2a, and then plug that into your equation, and so forth, so forth, or just use your calculator, it's fine as well, right? So this defines a parabola, which is what rockets follow. They, anything that has a projectile motion has a parabolic path. So that's nice, okay? Oh, looks like we got one more example, okay? Uh, this is the last example for real for this time, right? So we want to determine the total flight time and the horizontal traveled by the rocket in example seventh, right? So we have a quadratic value. If we want, we could solve this and um, set it equal to zero, use the quadratic formula, and figure out the distance traveled, right? Where does it land from where it starts? For a total flight time, however, we would want to use the um, parametric equations, right? So let's go ahead and go through this, right? So here, for example, seven, we have this equation for y in parametric form, okay? That's not the equation of the rocket in general. That is just the y value, the up and down values um, in times t, right? So if we wanna know how long it's been in the air, we wanna know when this equals zero because zero, the two zeros here will give us the initial time when it took off, which is zero, right? And the uh, other time when it hits the ground. So if I plug in zero here, it'll start at 3.36, and that's fine, okay? Um, and then I wanna know when it has a height of zero. So I want, if I plug in zero for y and solve this for t, I'll get a negative value and a positive value. The negative value doesn't make sense for a situation because we started on the table. The positive value will tell me the time it's been in the air, right? So that's what I'll use, right? Which tells the vertical position of the rocket at time t. So whatever t I get for when this is zero is the total time that we've been in the air, right? So we're gonna set this equal to zero because we wanna know when it hits the ground, when is y equal to zero? Laying on the ground means a height of zero. Quadratic formula, we just plug in our b, um, our a, and our c value into the formula, and then we can get a nice um, decimal approximation, one being negative, that doesn't make any sense, and one being positive. So it's been in the air for 2.1 seconds, okay? Now I can plug this into my parametric equation for x and get the total distance because the distance after 2.1 will be the x value, right? So that's us using the parametric equations to solve rather than uh, that quadratic we got all the way over here, right? Okay, so we can plug it into here. Doing so will give us 32 root three times 2.1, which is 116.4. So we get a distance of 116.4 feet from the table, okay? So if we want to uh, verify this, then we can graph this and then use the trace feature, um, right? So using trace, we get 116.39381, very close here to our approximate value because there's been some rounding going on, okay? We can do the same thing for the height to see how high it actually goes, um, but here you can also see that t is uh, 2.1, and the uh, height is zero, so you just use the one graph. Okay, that's it for our video series for trig. I hope you guys enjoyed yourself and I hope you learned a lot. I will see you in the next course.